glad that you are with us for our uh, next serve adventure, this time to Project Hope Alliance. So I'm very excited for this night ahead and all that it holds. Um, I think that just looking around the Zoom uh, call here, I think all of you have been with us on the previous, some of our previous serve adventures. Nonetheless, I will go ahead anyway and share some things that make this experience most enjoyable. And those pointers uh, that were in your email are to go to the top right of the screen. We encourage you to watch it in full screen. Use the speaker view. As you can see, we just started the uh, recording of this call. So if you have any problems with that, you'll probably have to exit because we need to record this so that we can show it to the people who had signed up and were had to drop out for various reasons at the last minute. Um, and, um, and then finally, we are about to, if we haven't already, mute everybody. Um, and we would just ask that you would remain muted for the entirety of the next hour. And then when we uh, get to 7.30, we, if not before, we will um, open it up for 15 more minutes of Q&A. So um, with that, um, I wanna actually begin tonight by giving a big shout out to the rest of the CERB team. Well, I, you'll be hearing my voice uh, for much of the night. Uh, you'll hear from Nathan um, at the, towards the end of the call, but Susie Lyons uh, is an integral part of our three-man team and every part of the, these adventures are really an all-team effort. And so Susie uh, works hard behind the scenes um, and runs all the videos and tech. So Susie, Nathan, thank you uh, for all that you do to make this night happen. With that, just as is true with every mission trip, um, and every time that we're just in relationship with people, we would ask for your grace for technical difficulties or stumbling over our words or whatever you whatever have uh, it may come up. Um, and then finally, um, you know, one these have been just spectacular nights to really highlight the realities of what it is that our ministry partners are doing. And so as you hear about Project Hope, we're excited for you to learn just probably a deeper dive than most of you or all of you have ever had to their work, their mission, um, and the tremendous um, effect that they've, or influence that they've had on hundreds and hundreds of families. Um, but beyond all of that, our hope and prayer would be that you just pay attention to that still small voice. There might be someone tonight that just came on to learn about Project Hope, but somehow in the midst of this evening, you might encounter the Holy Spirit prompting you to get more deeply involved or to learn more. And so we just want to encourage you to pay attention to any promptings of the Spirit or whispers from him. Um, with that, I would love to, um, first of all, welcome those of you who just uh, jumped on and kick it over to Nathan. Nathan, would you uh, do the honor of opening our night in prayer? Thank you. Father, we are grateful for your work in our lives and your care for your people and your care for children so evident in the gospels and what project hope alliance does with children we are thankful for we pray for your great blessing on this night as julie said that um your spirit would cut through some of the clutter and everything else that we would hear your voice hear your prompting of what we should take away and learn and uh, come alongside those that are serving <clears throat> um, some of the least in our communities. So we just pray your hand uh, on this meeting. May it bless you in all that is said and done in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce someone who is probably not a new name or face to you, but uh, she's been a longtime congregant and friend of our community. We love that she calls St. Andrews uh, her home church. Uh, but she is the president, or I'm sorry, the CEO of Project Hope Alliance. So join me in welcoming Jennifer Friend. Yay, Hi. Jennifer. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's great to see some, some familiar and some new faces all at the same time. Yay. Well, Jen, we're going to be hearing throughout this night about what you do, what Project Hope Alliance does. But before we get into all of that, we would love for you to share a little bit of just about who you are. Tell us a little, little bit about who Jennifer Friend Smith is. Wow, that's an existential question. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try. I'll try to give you a little, a little bit of, of insight. Uh, besides someone who has, I think, 
uh, nine mosquito bites. Um, so if you see me trying to scratch, <laughs> uh, but I, I get that honestly, um, from my garden. So I'm someone who really enjoys gardening, uh, during the pandemic. It's definitely been, I know I've, I've spoken to Julie a few times, um, while I was sitting in the backyard, I, I like to garden. Um, I'm a recovering trial lawyer. I, uh, am a mom of two. Uh, a senior in high school over at Newport Harbor uh, and a sixth grader over at Davis Magnet School. And I'm married. My husband and I will be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary uh, on December 28th. I know. I feel like that's a long time these days. Like that is a long time. (laughs) You made it. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Uh, And, you know, at 51, I can say I'm profoundly grateful to know that I'm where God wants me to be. I, I might not always be doing everything the right way, but I'm grateful to be where he's placed me. And I just try to wake up every morning and figure out what the next step is that he wants me to take. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm very grateful to be where I am right now. That's beautiful. I suppose that's true for all of us, right? You just wake up each day and go, Lord, what is it you have for us? How do we follow you anew today? So I love that. Uh, Jen, how long have you and your family been uh, attending St. Andrews? So I first, uh, the first day that we came, I brought my now senior in high school daughter and handed her over to Casey Kroger (laughs) and she was crying and then I started crying and then Casey said to me she put her arm on my shoulder and said we will love her into the kingdom oh goodness and I have to tell you that I those words I knew for a fact that that's exactly what was going to happen so that was 16 years ago almost 17 yeah Boy, I love that. Good job, Casey. I, I know. Uh, I pray that we would all represent Christ like that. Well, Jen, just under 10 years ago, you made some really life-changing decisions following a revelation you had about your purpose. Um, fortunately, we have a video that outlines a bit of that journey that you uh, had, and it was actually shown in services in, right here at St. Andrews in October of 2012. So let's take a look a little bit of of Jen's journey. My story is that over the last two years, my life has pretty much been flipped upside down and chicken around and then turned sideways. It started when my dad died suddenly and it caused me to start really looking at, at who I wanted to be and who I was. I started a life group here um, I think about uh, eight months after my dad died and there were all these amazing women in the life group and I had started doing work with Project Hope Alliance, which is a nonprofit that reaches out to homeless children and families in Orange County through education and family support. And I had come out with my own personal story about being homeless. Um, My dad had his own business, he was an entrepreneur, and so things came in really drastic ebbs and flows. And we ended up living in uh, motels on and off. So I started sharing what I was doing with Project Hope and how that was hard for me and my own past and my own story and some of my struggles about where I thought God wanted me to be. Project Hope Alliance was looking for a new executive director. I was on the search committee. And at the same time we were going through the story, Kelly uh, preached on Esther and she was you know, talking about for such a time as this. And I had had someone four weeks before Kelly's sermon. She prayed and part of her prayer was, you know, Lord, her life has been a series of events for such a time as this. And when Ke- Kelly said that, 
And she was talking about, you know, how God gives us the tools that we need to do the work that he calls us to do. And I started praying for the first time in earnest about where God wanted me to put my professional life. And it was scary to do that um, because I was, in my own mind, you know, I was putting up all of the things that, all of the excuses, all the reasons I couldn't do it, all of the reasons why I wouldn't be able to go into nonprofit, what I would be leaving, what would that mean to my family. And I was really in a place where I didn't want to not accept the invitation and I wanted to not make excuses and so I decided in my heart that that's what I was going to do. I resigned from my partnership at my law firm effective January 1st and uh, I'm going to become the full-time executive director for Project Hope. So it's pretty crazy. <laughs> for the first time I am truly waiting on the Lord to see what He's inviting me into. My name is Jennifer Friend Smith, and I'm not a fan, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Hold on, you're you muted. Well, shucks. <laughs> it made me cry again too, Jen. I see that even as you um, relive those moments as you shared that intimate journey so beautifully and authentically um, still brings emotion to you. So we're so, I just want to say thank you for that um, bit of your heart shared so vulnerably all those years ago. Well, um, and I, I can't imagine what would have happened had you not uh, been obedient to the spirits uh, prompting in your spirit and imagine the amount of families' lives that would not have been impacted had you not responded. So we just honor you for that. Well, that video gave us insight into really the genesis of your transition into Project Hope. But since that was nine years ago, uh, would you tell us a little bit about what's happened since then? It's actually, I haven't watched that in a while. And I, um, the tears, the tears I was crying, um, were coming from a place of expectancy and, and honestly mm -hmm. also fear, right? I mean, I, I was at the high, I was making equity partner the month that I resigned. So I was already an income partner and, um, uh, we had a mortgage to reflect. I mean, we, it was a, um, it was a big decision for someone who had been evicted probably, I don't know, 19 times by the time that they were 20. Wow. Um, so when I look at that, I, I, I see, I see um, almost kind of the, the spirit that Project Hope, Hope was in in that moment, which was this, this time of knowing that God was, was wanting to do something and not knowing what it was. Mm -hmm. And as my daughter kind of says, uh, nerve sighted, you're nervous and excited. Um, I would almost say terror sighted a little bit if I was being totally candid. But at that time, uh, when I shared about Project Hope, we were serving 65 kids that attended one particular school in Orange. Um, Project Hope basically was founded by the First Presbyterian Church of Orange uh, that started basically having a school in the basement of its church and then um, developed into a public school campus and Project Hope worked sort of like a foundation and we paid for transportation to pick kids up from hotels and shelters and bring them to school and back to the hotels and shelters every day. And that work was really important and that work was the work that we were called at that time. Um, I can tell you now we serve on more than 43 campuses throughout Orange County. Um, we were just doing, we're getting ready to release our annual report. And just in this last year, we've grown over 400% in the number of individuals we've served. So that puts us close to 6,000 wow. uh, children, youth, and, and adults experiencing homelessness. 
Um, but the most important thing is in the same way that at that time, at that one school, we were on campus, in the middle of the kids' lives going to where they were. Now that's what we're doing all over Orange County. Um, and most specifically in Newport Mesa, I mean, we have our own offices on school campuses. So we show up at 7.30, 8 a.m. when the kids are coming in and needing food or maybe they slept unhoused the night before and so they need clothes from our clothing closet or maybe they're facing suspension and they need us to go with them to a suspension meeting with the school administration to explain that it wasn't that they were ditching, it's that they literally couldn't get physically to school. And the way that we've evolved in the ability to really step into and walk alongside the lives of our kids, supporting their educational development and their emotional and spiritual development. It's kind of crazy, I had no idea what in the world God was in, had in store. And I mean, we've had conversations and I've had conversations with some of you on this call. I mean, Suzanne came to our office when our office was a third the size, we were still figuring things out. And every year I would say, oh my gosh, what is God doing this year? I can't, I'm trying to just keep up. I'm trying to show up and keep up. But I mean, it's a, uh, it's incredible. And we just keep trying to answer the call that he places um, on our lives. And we've really gotten hyper-focused on serving our children and youth ages, kindergarten, all the way to 24, um, making sure that they have the educational support, kind of like back in the day when the teacher started it by tutoring kids in the, um, in the parking lot of motels. She just showed up for the kids where they were and we're, we're still doing that today. That's amazing. You know, it's been um, a, such a privilege to watch you scale. I mean, this, I'm going, I'm about to begin my seventh year at St. Andrews. My anniversary, seven year anniversary is in March. And so we, it was a, a somewhat of a similar, similar journey. I feel like I've really watched God's hand go uh, before you in your ministry and continue to see you expand where there's opportunity, but also narrow where uh, opportunity and vision uh, require you to do so. So that's been beautiful. Um, I know that uh, most of you or many of you on this call were attending St. Andrews uh, when we were doing our capital campaign. And as you may remember, extending the family was one of the four arms of our big capital campaign. And um, as such, uh, we had a pretty significant partnership with Project Hope. Um, Jen, tell us a little bit about how St. Andrews got involved in that and, and, and uh, how we got to celebrate and impact lives together. Yeah, I, I have to start though, really before the capital campaign. Um, okay. I talked a little bit about it in the video about my small group, but I had decided that I, I felt God calling me to get more intimately engaged in, in a small group to both have discipleship as well as community. And so I was kind of nervous about it, to be honest with you, because I'm like, how in the world am I going to fit this in? I got two small kids and a job and what have you. So, you know, it was just like a random selection. And I go to my first small group and the small group median age was really women who had raised their children. Their children had, had left the house. They were off in college. And I was sitting there thinking, uh, I love these women, but God, is this really like, is this the season for me to have this small group? Oh my gosh. Little did I know that it was those women and their wisdom and their experience and their discernment and their pointed encouragement, they're the ones that gave me and prayed with me through the decision to leave my law firm. So before the capital campaign was even a thing, it really was those women who gave me that, that confidence and that encouragement to really, you know, basically it was like, do you believe God's promise or not like if you don't yet that's okay we'll pray with you to, but if you do then we you got to do this um and so that's kind of that's where that started and i just want to honor the importance of, of mm. being in community in that way because it makes all the difference and having a, a intergenerational congregation like saint andrews is such a critically valuable thing 
um, that it allows for us to have people speak into our lives that have already lived different seasons that maybe we're now in the middle of. Um, Boy, that's but beautiful. Then- we need to capture that story and get that out there because you just borrowing the faith of these women who are in different seasons of life as they um, as they saw a vision that you couldn't yet. I, I just think that's so beautiful. I'd never heard that part of your story. So thank you. Sorry, keep going. No, no. And it's, it's an important, it's a, such an important part of it. Um, mm-hmm. And so then when we did the welcome home campaign, um, you know, the church said, well, welcome home. You're ending homelessness. And at the time we were, we were doing permanent housing. So The church committed to moving, um, originally it was 250 families out of homelessness into permanent housing. The congregation showed such an abundance of generosity and support for our community. I think we exceeded 300. If I'm, if I'm not wrong, I think it was something close to 311 families that we were able as a congregation to move out of homelessness into permanent supportive housing. And then very critically, that allowed for us to continue stepping and speaking into the lives of of the children and youth in those families. And just, I have to tell you, you know, um, there are a few times that uh, LaShawn, hi, and I, some of you I know have met LaShawn, but you know, it was Susie Eckelman, me and LaShawn for a long time. It was like the three of us, and then maybe it was the five of us, but Same really, like, I can tell you exactly when we were being attacked and we would go around the office and just pray around the office. And we would call our friends at St. Andrews and we would say, I, we need prayer warriors. And this church stepped up in prayer and continues to, in a very significant way that I'm sure, I mean, Bonita and I have talked about this. We can feel it. Mm -hmm. We felt it during the pandemic when we were stepping out and with with so many of you running basically into the burning buildings not knowing what covid was or or what what the risk was to to our health um, but in every way imaginable this congregation basically poured into project hope and enabled it to be what it is today for the kids mm-hmm. but for this congregation and my church family we wouldn't we wouldn't be here wow Well, for those of you who were part of that and contributed to the Welcome Home campaign, thank you for being part of this. Those funds that have uh, ended up changing the lives or affecting the lives of so many youth um, really went, as as I understand it, to to staff you guys and to resource you to provide everything that you needed to do through all of your VAST programs. This is a full wraparound um, service organization, which you're going to hear about in a little bit. So it was the generosity and funds, more importantly, the prayers and the friendship that came alongside uh, what God was doing in Jen and her team. Uh, So in light of that, uh, you guys have grown so much um, in uh, supporting youth experiencing homelessness throughout Orange County. And your work is deep and it is intentional. Um, what I love about it is it's always got the kid at the center of every decision that you make. And so with that, let's watch our next video. We believe fundamentally that our greatest hope is in our children. When you look at Orange County, it is a beautiful place. There's two versions of Orange County. There's the versions you see on TV, beautiful coastlines, big houses. You have the beaches. And then there's the reality. In Orange County alone, we have over 28,000 children experiencing homelessness. And right now in our country, homelessness involving children and families has increased by over 70% in the last decade. Orange County has a really specific homeless population. It's not your typical on the street individual that's in rags. What we call is homelessness in the open. Whether they're living in a motel, a car, uh, doubled up with another family, you can have a home, but you're not housed. We don't realize that the car that's parked next to us is actually where a family of four is sleeping at night, that in all of those motels down the street here are families and children 
that are calling that motel room home. The conversations that we're having around homelessness, they're not being heard and they're not being seen. And at Project Hope Alliance, our job is to make the invisible visible so that we can end the cycle of homelessness one child at a time. The power of our work is in the people who come to work every day and everybody is here for the right reason and that is to change lives for our kids. We're fortunate at Project Hope Alliance to have a very talented, diverse team. We call ourselves Team Kid. The driving force is to be that support system, to empower our families, to really see that they're not alone. Our kids right now, they don't have a voice at the table. Children experiencing homelessness are on average two full school years behind. They go on average to four different schools a year. And what that means is that they need to have the ability to not only catch up academically, but take their education with them wherever they go. What makes Project Hope unique in the services that we provide is that we journey with our kids all the way to the age of 24. So a lot of time our families just need the things that we take for granted every day. Um, access to regular healthy food, uh, means to transport themselves to different areas in the community. So gas cards, bus passes. We make sure that we're filling out their FAFSA forms. We take them on college tours. We help them fill out their college applications. If they need to get a driver's license, well, they use our car to get a driver's license. At Project Hope Alliance, what defines success for us is change lives. That type of work does not happen overnight. In order to end the cycle of homelessness, you have to be a systems thinker. And so we've built programs that fit within that system. The first is our Bright Start program, which is an online multilingual curriculum for our K through sixth graders. The second is our on-site case management for youth experiencing homelessness for seventh grade all the way to age 24. And then 100% of our kids are graduating from high school. We are giving them hope, we're giving them support, and ultimately that will lead into ending the cycle of homelessness. There's no way we could do all the work that we do without the support of a community. And all we need is people like you joining our Visible Army. So that none of our kids and none of their kids and none of their grandkids are ever going to be counted in the number of children, youth, or families experiencing homelessness. We're ending the cycle. We are support. We are disruptors. We are proactive. We are possibility. We are here. We are hope. We are hope. We are hope. We are the visible army. We are the visible army. Visible army. Visible army. We are the visible army. This is our work. This is our movement. I love um, that we were able to just see a, a broader a stroke of what you guys do. But my favorite part of that uh, reminded me of Jesus uh, when you said uh, that you make the invisible visible and you just imagine Jesus walking the streets and you know that he was the one who with a child or someone who had leprosy or someone who was outcast from society. And Jesus was the first one to go and bring visibility to those people and to restore dignity. And that is what Project Hope does. And so um, what a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful film capturing what it is that you guys do. Um, and I, I also love Jen, just thinking about how, um, God has so uniquely created you, uh, you are a systems thinker and you approach this. And I think so much of your success as an organization in impacting lives is because of your approach. So we honor you for that. Well, as a church, uh, you know, we so often talk about being a neighborhood church uh, right here in our own backyard. We're positioned literally right across the street from a high school. Talk to us a little about the realities of homelessness right here. Yeah, and uh, it was also neat to see that video because Tia, um, one of the women in the video has been out on maternity leave and she comes back on Monday and I've missed seeing her face. So that was, <laughs> that was kind of lovely uh, to see that. You know, uh, Newport Harbor High School was actually the very first campus that we went on to. 
So one of the things about the invisibility of childhood homelessness is that it's intentional, right? So parents who like mine are living in, you know, when I was a kid living in motels, they don't want anyone to know because you don't know if social services is going to be getting involved because of your housing status. You, as a kid, don't want anyone to know that you're living in a motel because you're experiencing shame as a result of that. Uh, and so what happens is schools don't necessarily know who the kids are that are experiencing homelessness. And when they do know who those kids might be, there isn't actually a uh, developed real-time process for them to get help right away. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things about being a systems thinker is you have to think, how is it that you eliminate all the barriers that prevent you from making transformational change? And so if you're a kid experiencing homelessness, probably the biggest barrier you have is transportation. You have no control basically over being able to get anywhere. Don't have a car. If you're seven years old, you're not going to take a public bus maybe to go to um, a social services center or a family resource center. But in most instances, even though obviously students experiencing homelessness attend school at a lower rate than their house peers, they're still showing up at school. So we thought, how do we plug ourselves into the system where the kids were and eliminate the largest barrier that they have, which is is transportation. Also, what we know is that this area, while it has tremendous affluence, also has a lot of poverty. Mm. West Side Coast de Mesa, I mean, Shalimar, right? We think about just the things that our, our congregation has been involved in in West Side Coast de Mesa, um, Whittier Elementary. I mean, we know these things to be true. But the number of families that are living tripled up where maybe a kid is sleeping with four other people on the floor of a kitchen, uh, their parents are paying or mom, or maybe the child is, uh, if they're a teen, they're paying for a space on the floor. Uh, they're coming to school, but people don't know that they're actually experiencing homelessness. And so during the, before the pandemic, we already, we have a 30 to one ratio. So for every one case manager, uh, there are 30 students. Again, to be able to do this work that's, that's as deep as it is where, you know, we basically are doing life with our kids. We have to have, have a ratio that's appropriate. So we've only been scaling in a way that doesn't dilute the effectiveness of our work. That's great. So we started out and we started Newport Harbor High School and we quickly filled up two case managers. So that was 60, 60 kids. Uh, we then went to Ensign and placed a case manager on Ensign's campus, filled that case manager up. Then we went to Costa Mesa Middle, Costa Mesa High, Estancia, now we're at Tewinkle, and then we're also serving the elementary schools as well. Pre-pandemic, we probably had um, roughly 50 students that were still attending K through 12th grade school that we were working with. We started out working with a lot of older ones that so they had graduated. Um, and we were working with Newport Mesa Unified School District to get more referrals for students experiencing homelessness. We were still serving students all over Orange County. So our numbers were in the hundreds of kids that we were serving. But just looking at our literal backyard, right, Newport Harbor High School, Ensign, um, during the pandemic, a couple of things happened. Number one, the school shut down. And number two, the teachers didn't know where the kids were. And the kids were required to access school via Zoom, which re required they had Wi-Fi and Chromebooks. And so while we have amazing teachers and administrators in this school district, they're limited, right, in the, in the ability for them to know where every kid is and our population so transient. There are a lot of motels that are up Harbor Boulevard and Old Newport Boulevard where our families are migrating basically to different motels. So a teacher might have known that they were at the Sandpiper Inn, but maybe they ran out of money to pay for the Sandpiper Inn. So now they're in San Bernardino sleeping on someone's floor, right? Wow. But we knew where they were. 
And so what ended up happening and coming out of COVID was Newport Mesa Unified School District actually handed over to us a list of every student that it had identified as experiencing homelessness in its district it was over 300 students. Wow. We added those to the list of kids we were already serving. So by that time we were up to about 125 students just in the schools that are right around the church. Wow. And we just started calling the kids okay. to find out what their immediate needs were because we didn't have enough case managers to bring them into our full program, but we wanted to know, do you need food? Do you have Wi-Fi? Do you have Chromebook? Those types of things. Um, and we were able, as a result of the pandemic as well, and because we had these relationships, we were able to get funding actually from Newport Mesa Unified School District, just put in $150,000 so we could hire more case managers. Awesome. And the city of Costa Mesa just last week awarded us $162,000 to support our ability to, right? I mean, that is a huge deal. Yes. Yeah. So God took the stewardship of partners like St. Andrews and multiplied it so that as we're being able to build the identification of more students, we're also being able to add the resources. Um, the latest number that we just got last week from Newport Mesa Unified is they are preparing to turn over a list to us of over 500 students, new students, experiencing homelessness that wow. have been identified to them. 500 new students new. in addition yes. to just in Newport Mesa School yes. District. Yes. That's astonishing. Yes. Wow. And those are the counted numbers. So if we look at Orange County as a whole, we know we have over 33,000 identified students experiencing homelessness pre-pandemic. So those numbers are the 2019-2020 uh, numbers. We know as a, as a um, state, we have enough students experiencing homelessness to fill Dodger Stadium five times over. Wow. Those are the identified kids. Those aren't the kids like me and my three brothers who are hiding the fact that they're experiencing homelessness. Hmm. But the hope that lies in this is that it took us this long to get the ability to have the list handed over. And we're now working together in a coordinated systems fashion, right? So our faith community is a huge part of that system because there are things that we can do with our faith partners and spaces that we can go into to support our families and our kids that we couldn't go into with our government partners. And so now that we're able to match all of those systems players to support our kids, the opportunity for expansion is really tremendous. That's why we, we just went into Santa Ana Unified. So the city of Santa Ana um, funded us to come in and start serving one particular kindergarten through eighth grade campus um, called Henninger. So we have two case managers that um, are staffed at, at, that, at that location. But this pandemic has... Uh, has done a lot of devastation to our neighborhood, specifically our church neighborhood. Um, there, between um, people passing away of COVID, um, adults actually uh, being deported and, and children who have been born here and are, are, are in the school system remaining. Um, and then just the devastation of job loss. So um, we are anticipating that that, that uh, roster of 500 kids will probably grow most specifically in the next 90 days because the moratorium on evictions is going to be lifted. And so the timeliness of, of us being able to staff up and be prepared for this and God continues. I mean, I go to bed sometimes and I'm like, okay, Lord, I don't. I don't know how we're going to do this. And he makes a way um, every time. So, so that's what it looks like. I, I don't mean to be doom and gloom. There's hope in the midst of it because we are plugged into systems now in a way that we never were before. We have partners um, that offer us kind of a even stool, so to speak, to sit firmly upon. 
Um, but it's our, our, our immediate neighborhood um, is, is, is really hurting right now. And Sounds Bonita like will it. share a little bit what that looks like in the lives of our kids, but. Yeah, okay. Wow. Um, well, Jen, I um, uh, am so blown, blown away and humbled. What, what an incredible invitation for all, all of us to be in prayer, um, as well as to pay attention for how the Lord might have us respond to that need. Um, I sent you a little text in the middle of that because my previous text was off. So I just wanted to flag that. Sorry about okay. that. No worries. Um, so I, I, um, then I do want to quickly add something. You, you betcha. Um, the goal really for us is to get our kids to graduate high school. So yeah. all of these systems are working in unison to get our kids to graduate from high school. That one act makes them almost 400% less likely to be homeless as an adult. Wow. And that's how you end generational homelessness and poverty. And so we really focus on that, that outcome. Um, so I did, that's all of these things come yeah. together in a, in a singular purpose. Yeah. Um, really quickly in, in, if you can do this in a minute or, or less, cause you've already touched on, on some of this, but, um, what does make project hope different from other nonprofits serving homeless youth? I mean, I think some of it is obvious by what you've shared, but expand just briefly on, on that for us. If you it's would. really us living on the school campuses. So we're able to get real-time referrals from school nurses, janitors, the um, nutrition department, school counselors. The kids are on campus. They come to our office. They tell us what they need. We advocate for them in life as well as on the campus. But that act of being physically present and plugged into their system is transformational in its ability to effectuate change. Amazing. Well, Jennifer, uh, you have a little video that you would like us to show. Can you just uh, let us know what we're about to see so we have a lens for it? So the Visible Life uh, video is actually, um, it's based on me, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Uh, it, it really is, is the journey that I went through, and it's what God has put on my heart to make sure that every child knows that they're seen and they're loved and they're cherished and they're valued and that they're not alone in this journey. And if they do their part and they ch choose to show up every day in the same way that God faithfully walks alongside us, we do our part in faithfully walking alongside them. Wow. All right. Let's take a look. Room for four, please. Uh, just one. Here, honey, this is all we have. Officers can arrest people at encampments. That's a clamp down on the homeless encampment. Is that the homeless girl? I think so. Okay, everybody, find your seats. Find your seats, please. <laughs> I don't know, okay? I don't know what she wants. I, I can't handle her right now. Take her. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming in today. So what's been going on? What is this? It's a bus pass. Get better, kid. We're going to end up with another crisis like we have on our southern borders. If we try. Those are groceries for your family. That should hold you over for a little bit. You feeling better, baby?
Hey, Sarah, great news. We were able to get you cleats and a jersey so you can try out. Thanks. Hey, Sarah, see you at soccer practice. Wow, Jen, thanks for sharing your story in video form. Um, so vulnerable, so brave, and gives us really a great picture into that. And I, I, uh, I think that what might be kind of um, the next step would maybe be to let Bonita kind of share what it is that she sees in the lives of our kids today. Um, because Bonita is out there a fierce warrior for the kids every day um, in, in courage and in faith. And, and I think that, that she might be able to, to share a bit about what our kids are going through right now. Awesome. Well, Benita, welcome. Thank you. You are the Parent Outreach and Special, special Education Manager at Project Hope. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do in your role. Okay. Um, what I do is... I continue to provide each student with their needed support um, within their school and home environment. And we do this, well, I do this by providing emotional support. It could be mentorship. I also um, provide ass different assessments in order to create uh, their individualized uh, programs and goals. Um, I also provide academic and career guidance up to, uh, for our older youth, especially up to the age of 23, as Jen had mentioned. Um, I currently have uh, about 19 uh, clients, better known as students. And out of the 19, 10 of them live um, in the motel located in Santa Ana, Teston and Anaheim areas. Um, and the remaining of uh, my clients are in the Costa Mesa area. Um, the nine clients that are, um, they're usually doubled up, tripled up, uh, couch surfing, or actually living in the cars, their family's car. Um, I do service uh, 10 clients that are in currently living in the motel. Um, yeah, so that's in a nutshell of what we do. Um, and then also I provide not only the academic support that's needed, but we also provide, um, I kind of mentioned it as far as the mental support, as well as um, any needed food. A lot of my clients in the motel especially are um, in need in food and thank goodness they're back in school so that they could have that, that meal, that lunch, that breakfast. And sometimes that would be it for the student until the next day. Wow. Uh, Bonita, how brave of you to go in and work with these families. I just can only imagine, uh, I'm picturing you walking into a motel room, seeing you know a family of five living in the same room as two other families of three or four, and just how chaotic that learning environment would be as you assess their needs and work with each child. Um, with the school closures last year, Bonita, the issue of youth homelessness has been highlighted. How has this impacted Project Hope and the work you continue to do for the kids? Well, we've really seen a rise on the mental health piece. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our students have been experiencing um, depression or anxiety, especially um, of the fact that, like you had mentioned, they're enclosed and some of them living in a one, uh, one room with their families. So um, they're feeling um, not only anxious, but um, closed in. A lot of them are feeling lonely. 
um, due to being isolated in the home and sometimes not having the uh, appropriate technology to help them with their schoolwork, mm -hmm. um, they have to figure out their, their schoolwork on their own. And so they're, um, let's see, they're, they just had a low self-esteem of not being able to figure out their homework and not being able to stay connected to a teacher or getting a hold of a teacher in a timely manner. So um, that was disparaging to them. Um, yeah, I mean, this COVID has really taken effect on our students as well as the parents. Um, I also noted that a lot of the families that are living in the motel, I don't know if you, you know this, but a lot of them, not all, but many of them experience um, some sort of um, delay, academic delay. And it could be due to autism, it could be due to um, a learning disability or uh, emotional behavior. And we find that it was a rise more so um, with our kiddos in the motel. Mm. And that wow. emotional piece also stemmed over to our general ed students as well. So um, that's why I just wanted to note that we, we are there for the students now more so for the emotional piece and providing them the different resources of where to go to get that um, needed therapy. Yeah. And we, and an, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I, I was just going to add uh, to Bonita, one thing that, that we noticed um, with the isolation also came a lot of, especially for our young, our younger girls, came a lot of risky sexual behavior. Yes. Um, because they were so, they felt so alone and isolated and they were really just craving connection, um, that that was something that we've never seen it be um, that uh, rampant, I guess, to use a word. And the gangs um, have just been on open season when the schools were closed. Um, now with them reopening, it's, it's getting a little bit better, but both sex traffickers as well as gangs were just really um, continuing to pry on our kids, but they had a lot more access to our kids than they did when our kids were in school. Wow. Perfect. Gosh, that is just such a nightmare. It's so interesting to hear about all the statistics of, uh, or the ways, not statistics, that um, people are just preying on the vulnerable amidst mm -hmm. this time. So again, thank you guys for standing in the gap. Um, we're about to um, transition to Nathan Donaldson, but uh, Bonita or Jennifer, do either of you have any other kind of comments before we talk about ways that uh, people can get involved? You're welcome to take a couple minutes if there's anything else you wanna share. I, I would just say that I know that it has been very meaningful to Bonita and I when we were going out into the field to have the members of St. Andrews coming alongside of us. And we saw so many um, of you all. And it was not only desperately needed, but it was highly encouraging to us as well as our entire team. And so we, we thank you for your presence uh, during that season. Um, and really, this is the time. This is the time for us to step up for our kids in a big mm -hmm. way. Um, and we're excited to continue to have you guys as, as our, our teammates in that. Thank you. You know, yeah. one of our favorite things that, oh, sorry, but Nina, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I totally agree, Jennifer. I was just saying yes. <laughs> Good. One of our favorite things with our ministry partners here at St. Andrews is, is, is partnership. And so when this pandemic began, Jen, you called, uh, I know a number of churches, but I know, I, th I think we were one of your first calls and, and just said, hey, this is what we're doing. And you, you completely shifted, you pivoted, you went into a different gear, you, um, you guys just rallied and we, uh, you led us in knowing how to respond as we were so disoriented in how to respond in this time. And so thank you for the invitation. It really did feel like a partnership. Well, um, Susie. One other so, thing, Julie. Um, yep which should be definitely noted. And that is, um, I would like to thank Nathan. Yep. Um, also um, Mariner's Church, not only for providing the food um, to help serve our families, but also most importantly, we were able to uh, provide prayer right there on the mm -hmm. spot. And I yep. know that some, there were some of 
the uh, families that lived in the motel that came to the church. And I was yeah. just so happy to hear that. Yeah. That, um, someone was um, being encouraged and inspired to hear the word. Absolutely. Well, you said that well, because my next introduction was to uh, Nathan Donaldson, uh, our team kind of shares, uh, has different purview over various ministries and uh, Project Hope falls under Nathan Donaldson. He is our director of missions and hospitality. And so Nathan, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, this partnership during the pandemic and how you led. And, and actually, before I say that, I just want to say I honor you, Nathan. I just add to what Bonita and Jennifer just said, you did an incredible job um, serving. So tell us a little bit about that season. Well, what, it, it has been so much fun to get to know you, Bonita, um, and Jen, as we serve together. So as was talked about, um, Jen had reached out to uh, us, St. Andrews, to see how we could join them with some motels. And so we started going to uh, Tustin and Santa Ana, a couple of motels there. We would go to one every other week, uh, just flip-flop, and we'd provide food and connect with the kids living there. Um, and that was a great way for Bonita and her team to kind of know where are they, what school districts they in, what are they needing? And um, in some of the ways to do that, just to break down some of the barriers is to provide food, to provide something. Um, the Ecology Center in South Orange County provided um, uh, fresh vegetables and things for people. And then our church provided for just these motels about 1,200 bags of food uh, during that time. And that was uh, a huge, huge help to just walk through and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, see that. And you'll see there are bags all over the place that uh, in these pictures. And as Bonita is saying, we had time to pray. There's Gail praying with uh, people afterwards. Um, Troy and Caleb there with Bonita um, setting up before we start delivering out to rooms and starting to, to meet people. But one of the great things, as Julie and Jen have said, it's about the kids. And so through donors and PHA, they were able to provide dozens and dozens of Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots to enable kids to get connected back with their schools during, uh, during the pandemic and they were able to uh, be online and get connected back in. And as Bonita had said earlier, some of those kids were kind of on their own and now they are client students that Bonita and some others are working with from those motels that we were at. So what a great, great time. We had about 14 people that took part in this ministry over a year and a half time, um, and uh, some people only came for a handful of times. Some people came the entire time. Some people came for a couple months and helped us out. We had a young guy who uh, helped us um, and then had to head back to college and, uh, up in Northern California. And so it was just a, a great time to actually be the hands and feet uh, of Jesus uh, to those folks. So we continue that because we've transitioned to a couple of motels that we were mentioned earlier, a couple of motels down on Newport Boulevard that we now go to uh, every other week. And we've actually come up with a little different pattern. We now bring personalized pizzas to each of them and gives us an opportunity to get to know them and talk with them and pray with them. And then we are also doing small 15 minute gatherings. Uh, the managers in these places have allowed us to use their patios or out by the pool. And we invite folks to come out and we are able to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus and the saving grace that comes through him. So this has been uh, just an awesome opportunity to, to do that. So if people are still are, are interested, we definitely need many more to join us. We'd love to be able to touch more and more uh, motels. There are just so many up and down Harbor and, and Newport Boulevard that, uh, that need need to be known, need to be um, connected to. So that's one way that you can get involved. Another way, let me just jump in with about five years ago, Jen, uh, from my understanding, it was before my time, Jen came to St. Andrews and asked, is there some way that we could uh, provide food to, to uh, fill up their pantry that they give out to so many people there on the west side of Costa Mesa? And so that started this great uh, fun event uh, called the PHA Packing Party, and it has not gone on for the last couple of years, 
but we are talking through how we can stir this back up and start this again and most likely it will happen in March of this next year, very early in this process. And if you'll know, it's about a five or six weeks that we're giving out bags with lists of things that are needed. Our church has been so generous with bringing back hundreds and hundreds of bags over the time. And then we spend a full day after church, um, all kids, adults, everything else, packing these things, sorting all the food, putting them in, in order so that they're easy to then uh, put in, uh, in uh, PHA's pantry and be able to distribute to those that need it. So that will be coming up. So look for that uh, to come uh, in the very near future. And then one other way I want to just mention to you, uh, and that is through Project Hope Alliance's mentor program. So they um, have been very focused uh, and are expanding this a little bit in the age group. My understanding is kindergarten through high school that uh, you can come alongside, meet with a child once a week, uh, meet at a neutral location for an hour or two. You don't have to be a tutor. Uh, you don't have to know how to do new math or new new math or whatever it is now. Um, and uh, it's really to have um, it's really to have a connection of adult uh, that has some stability and connection with them. They're asking for a year's commitment with that. And so if you would just follow that that student through their year and just be somebody that they can share with and you can play games, you can do whatever. Um, and as we know, Newport Harbor is right across the street from us, might even be a great opportunity to meet with an Ensign student or a Newport Harbor student and be able to meet with him on campus, hang out in the plaza, go down into the youth center and do some things that are, um, that are um, connecting and uh, continuing a relationship. So I'll put that link um, in just a moment in the chat of how you can get involved. They kind of match up your interests with the student's interests and you're not committed to anything if you just want to see about getting involved and, and just fill out their application for that. And that is it on my plate, unless there's anything else that you all want to share, uh, Bonita or, and Jen. No, well, Julie, Julie well, I think that in, in a, another email or something, there will be an opportunity for y'all to help us win a $150,000 grant from Chick-fil-A by voting for us on the Chick-fil-A <laughs> app. We can do a lot of good work for the kids with that. So um, I didn't hear all that. Yes, we're so excited about that. Jen and I talked about that just before the call. Um, they actually sent me the email or our whole team the email earlier this week. It's very easy. It took about 30 seconds. It might take about two minutes if you don't have the Chick-fil-A app. Uh, but I uh, voted immediately. They're up against five, I think five other organizations. And so um, Nathan is going to drop those details in the chat. It will also be in an email, but they need all the votes they can get because it's, uh, as you can tell, their work is vast and there's a, there are a lot of kids in the pipeline and we need to continue equipping them to do their work. Well, we have come to the end of our uh, program. Nathan, thank you for sharing. Thank you again for leading the charge. It's fun to uh, see the fruit that has come out of this, uh, of, of just the, of Jen's idea to head into the most vulnerable, the most forgotten, those that aren't even in their, in their purview. They just chose motels that they could get into in the midst of a pandemic, knowing that there were, those were the vulnerable children. And out of that birthed our uh, motel ministry that still continues uh, we're also looking forward, as Nathan said, to helping to restock your pantry. Uh, for all of you to be aware of, though we are not doing a full-blown food pantry anymore, as we did all throughout the pandemic, anything that does come in in those blue bins, we collect and we give as soon as we have enough to take over, we take over. And so Project Hope is continuing to receive those. And that will be the case clear up until our packing party. Well, that's it for um the program part, we are now going to jump into q and I don't see, um, let's see, what does Cindy Talbot say here? Is there a question in there? Does the funding come from Newport Mesa come with any strings, expectations of reporting or limits on the faith aspects of your work with children and youth? Great question, Cindy. And anyone else can continue asking questions in the chat box. Yeah, so we do have reporting requirements. Uh, one of the things, though, that... Uh, has been a blessing because this is the first time we've ever accepted any public funds um, is that we were able to accept, 
accept them on our own terms. So the understanding was, yes, uh, we do have kids on the wait list and yes, we do require additional funds, but you need to let us do the work the way that we know how to do it. And so because we had already um, shown our proof of concept uh, for five years with a high school graduation rate that was more than 20% above the national average for youth experiencing homelessness, and our principals were coming to the school district saying they weren't having to suspend kids, they weren't having um, uh, issues with dropouts because we were on campus and it was actually shifting the culture of the campus, uh, we were able to just say, this is the work we do. If you're interested in partnering with us, then you will fund us, but we will, we will be responsible for dictating the way we do the work. Um, but it took us, you know, we, we had, again, we've been very discerning in our scaling. We're not interested in diluting the impact that God has called us to make in order to get money because it's about the kids. It's not about the money. And, and um, yes, and reporting does take time and it is kind of a pain. However, <laughs> it's for the kids. So uh, right now it, it's manageable again, because we've been able to, to accept the funds to do the work we're already doing. That's great. Do I see any other hands, any other questions? If so, you can unmute yourself and, uh, or just raise your hand and one of us will unmute you. I've got a question while we wait to, oh, Suzanne, go ahead. Um, well, Jennifer, I just want to second the fact that you have just done an amazing job and it was, it's been a blessing to <laughs> see how this ministry has evolved over the years. Um, being a systems person myself, I'm extremely interested as to um, how you manage to get into the school district. I understand the relationship building, the trust that needs to be in place, but was there a key individual at the city level or at the district level that really enabled you to, you know, like step into that space? and gain access to their names, which I would think would be an impossibility having dealt with the school district. So how did that come about? Because we would like to replicate it in other areas. <laughs> yes, so, and, and there will be a presentation at the National Alliance to End Youth and Childhood Homelessness in Atlanta on that very thing that I'll be making actually. Um, Yay. So the, the, I'll tell you what, I went in the back door. So Principal Bolton, if there is any one person that you would like to thank with deep community gratitude for making this possible, it would be Sean Bolton. So I approached Sean and said, this is what we want to do. And he said, come on in. So we already were able to get proof of concept and then we went to get a memorandum of understanding with the school district because Dr. Bolton was saying, I want them on my campus. They gave us a memorandum of understanding. And then Bolton told Shaka, who was then the principal of Ensign, if you don't let them on your campus, you're an idiot, give them a room. I went to a meeting other than being a parent of a kid that went to Ensign, I'd never met Shaka. I go in, I sit down. He says to me, we've got a room for you. It has a back act. Da, da, da. And then he says, by the way, what do you do? And I said, what? He said, Sean just told me that I need to give you a room and let you on my campus. What do you do? So we went on that campus and the impact was clear. And so then we had, a, we still have, I mean, the principal at Huntington, I met with him three years ago, and he still sends me emails. Uh, hey, by the way, um, when are you coming on my campus? Uh, we just submitted for a multi-year seed funding grant that would allow for us to go. I went to Huntington Beach High School. So we now have a list, um, but it was that one person, Suzanne, it wasn't anyone in the city. It wasn't anyone at the district. It was the principal of Newport Harbor High School, Dr. Bolton, who said, please come and do this for the kids they need it. And because of that, we were able to get our proof of concept, get data to support our work. 
And then it was just a matter really of funding. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So good. It's fun to see the favor that goes before you, Jen, and your and your team. Um, is there, are there any other, just my last question, um, unless I see any other question, uh, any other hands go up is, uh, what's next? As you look into the next year or two, um, you, you've spoken just now a little bit about some possibilities, but what are you looking forward to in this next season? Uh, we we're looking forward to actually having access to more kids. We're looking forward to showing the nation how it is that you identify students experiencing homelessness, you train up school administrators, teachers, and staff to mm -hmm. um, access them in a trauma-informed care way that will allow for them to then hand them on to someone else. Teachers have so much on their plate and the public school system was not designed to eradicate homelessness. Right. Um, but to show what that partnership, like Suzanne was saying, what does it look like for a lead educational agency and a community-based organization to come together, partnering with the community to be able to, in real time, eliminate the barriers that homeless students face. And so we have um, a waiting list of a few school districts um, that have already approached us that are just waiting. We have two um, specifically that God willing, we will be able in the next two years to go on to. We start at a high school campus and then we work down um, to, to start going into those. But on a national scale, we need to be educating people how to replicate this work mm -hmm. um, and, and how say. to do it effectively <laughs> and efficiently. Yes, may it be so. Well, we'll pray towards that end. And along with that, I guess I, um, uh, um, we'll ask one final question, which is how can we be praying for you? And then I will close us out. And Julie, Julia, I saw your question. Maybe we can email you that response. So how can we be praying for you and your team? Jennifer Bonita, we'd love to know. I would say to continue to give us strength as we um, work through this season um, with vaccine mandates, and um, the increased number of children that are going to be placed on our wait list, we really need the spirit to constantly encourage and replenish our souls because as you can imagine, this season that we're coming out of, our team never stopped working. Right. Um, in That's fact, we were, we were going into places where people were saying, can you please hug me? I haven't been touched for five months. Mm -hmm. wow. and, and kids, had no ability to do school. So for the Holy Spirit to continue to restore our, our strength, because our, our commitment is there, our zeal is there, but it would be, you know, this is, we're coming off of a big, heavy season mm -hmm. to go into another champion season. And so yeah. That's what do you good. think, Bo? Bonita? Uh, you're muted, Bonita. Sorry. I agree, Jennifer. And then also, if I can add the creativity part of it, um, for us to always be uh, creative and a, a step ahead of how to so that our students and clients and parents will want to. Oh, that's, that's well good. said. Yeah, that's really good. Well, let me, um, let me close this night in prayer. Let me pray over these requests and all of you, and then we'll sign off here. Oh, Lord, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise for how you have worked in lives. We thank you for uh, that still small voice uh, that the Jen responded to so many years ago. We thank you for the Esther call that she heard when Kelly Conwisher preached that sermon. And Lord, we just stand in awe, marveling at the ways that you have worked in and through this team and through the different seasons and uh, scaling and pulling back and scaling and pulling back and refined vision that we know came from you, but that was executed by a group of faithful servants who just wanted to be a part of helping the kids and making a difference generationally. Lord, for all of those 
lives that have already been impacted. We pray that you would continue, that your mercy and your grace right now would go before them and that they would be reminded, especially if they're in a season of discouragement, of the way that they, that, um, they experienced hope and change uh, because of uh, their intersecting lives with Project Hope. And for all those who are current clients or students, we pray that you would be the one who um, breathes new hope and new life in them. We pray for the waiting list of over 500 uh, just in Newport Mesa School District, Lord, that you would uh, somehow meet the needs of those even before Project Hope can be the hands and the feet that you use. But now, Lord, for this tremendous staff, not only just for Jennifer and Bonita, but for LaShawn and all the others who are part of this hardworking team, Lord, we know that sometimes um, it's just really wearying work to be about um, loving others. And they have no doubt uh, just sacrificed so much personally. Um, they've sacrificed health. I know some of them, uh, one of them almost even died, I think, because of COVID uh, as they served on the front lines. And so, Lord, would you restore their souls? Would you lead them beside clear water, uh, still waters? Would you um, give them creativity? Would you allow them to have a holy sense of yes to the things that they are supposed to say yes to when their hearts just desperately want to say yes, uh, but also, Lord, when they need to have a no, when all of their being wants to say yes, but if it's not of you, if it will simply wear them out more, I pray that you would give them wisdom to know what doors to say no to. We do pray, Father, we thank you for the favor that's gone before them, both um, locally and, and, inter and nationally. But we pray that this model would be replicated so that more families would have the uh, chains of homelessness broken and that they would be able to uh, become visible and encounter you. So Father, for all of the work of this organization, we just say thank you and yes and amen. Restore our brothers and sisters there. Would you just surprise each of them, even this week, I pray for them to experience something that would surprise them and that they would specially know that that is you strengthening their spirit. Thank you for everyone on this call. We honor you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you all, Jen, Bonita. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Thank you. All right. And thank please you. thank the rest of your team. I know your whole team couldn't be on tonight that we only invited you to, but would you just <laughs> please pass on our thanks for this amazing partnership that we share and uh, let them know we care. Oh, they know, they know big time <laughs> how much, how much the St. Andrews family loves them and they all feel it profoundly. So our love Thanks, is Lord. sent right back to all of you. So uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank Good night, you. everybody. Good night. Good night. Night, mom. Night, <laughs> Susie. <laughs> night, Jan. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Yo.